Hey, it's great to see every last one of you. One church, five locations. So not only do we have White Rock, NNT, we Guatemala, but also we've got North Dallas as well, Mockingbird Station, and Bishop Arts Oak Cliff. As a matter of fact, I've got two of our family members from our Oak Cliff campus up here with me today. This is John and Victoria Wynn. They are fantastic and wonderful. They have one of the cutest babies you will ever meet in your entire life, and she probably won't like you. But she's incredibly, incredibly cute. Her name is Ava. And I asked these guys to come today uh, and come from our Oak Cliff campus and just share a, a little bit about their story. They have uh, walked through some really, really, di a really difficult season. And, and as we, uh, as a church family, continue to grow, I, I want to make sure we continue to remember the one and know every person has a story and want to make sure we still stay engaged with all those stories. So, again, give John and Victoria a big old round of applause once again. We love you guys. Hey, uh, Victoria, can you share with us, why don't you start, and you can share with us a little bit about, uh, you know, what you walked through as you uh, brought baby Ava into the world. Yes, and again, I just want to honor you and Pastor Onika, and thank you for leading us and loving us so well, and our lives are forever changed oh, because of you in this church. Um, so, yes, whenever I delivered Ava, I was in excruciating pain. Uh, my doctor said, oh, it's normal, you're recovering. After five weeks of still not being able to sit, stand, or walk, uh, my friends were like, you need to get this checked out. We went to the doctor, got an MRI, an x-ray, and they said, oh, you fractured your pelvis. Um, so I was bedridden for four and a half months. Um, could not, I could not hold her. I could not change her diaper. I was feeding her, lying on my side. Somebody had to give her to me and take her from me. So you're saying you could not walk, you could not, could not walk. Goodness, okay. How did he do taking care of you? He did every, so he would rock Ava, put her to sleep, go downstairs to get me food. Um, Good job, John. He did laundry, he cleaned the house, he went to work, he did That's everything. what I'm talking about. Way yes. to step up, man. We're so proud of you. Yes. Well, that's the least he can do. You carried a human being in your body. Yes. Keep on going. I'm sorry. <laughs> so during this period, whenever I was, you know, in bed by myself, it was my lowest point. And I think that's where the enemy wants us, isolated with our own thoughts. But we had a community that refused to say no, that refused to allow us to isolate ourselves. My girlfriends were texting me, not even giving me a heads up, like, hey, I'm coming over for lunch. Or I'm coming over during my lunch break. I'm coming over after work. They would sit with me, lay with me. Um, John had an incredible group of guys that surrounded him, that encouraged him. And I know as a church, you all prayed for us. Yeah, well, we love you. And John, I'll give you a chance to uh, speak here. Again, well done uh, stepping up as a husband you, there. I'm really, really proud of that. What was it like for you as you're watching your wife uh, walk through this, this season? Yeah, I mean, it, it was incredibly difficult. Um, and we had walked through some serious issues in the past. In 2013, I was diagnosed with cancer, um, and at the time, that was just an, an amazing, incredible thing to even walk through. Um, but we didn't have that church community back then. But to even go through this, this was extremely difficult. I would say even more difficult for me to sit back and watch her have to go through this. Um, and I'm just so incredibly thankful for the community that we have, just continuously texting us, praying for us, uh, bringing us meals, um, and just encouraging and lifting us up. And it, even now, even in that tough season, they were still asking us the tough questions. How's your marriage? What are you guys doing to honor each other? How are y'all serving each other? Um, just so grateful for that, for that community that is just so for us. Wow. Well, uh, as I said earlier, uh, these guys are part of our Oak Cliff campus. Uh, Oak Cliff, that's my hood. That's what you say. So if you didn't know what was supposed to be said there, that's what's supposed to be said. And uh, we, we love our Oak Cliff campus so much. Uh, but it was the collective generosity of our church family. It was people giving their money so that we could launch that campus so we can reach people in a whole nother community. And I just want to say again a huge thank you to Shoreline City for your generosity. And we are back in that season again at the end of the year as a church where we're saying, hey, 
Let's galvanize our resources together and let's go ahead and love on and serve some more John and Victoria wins that are out there that we might not know yet. What we want to do is make sure we're connecting the dots for everyone. There are very real people on the other side of our generosity. And we're talking about a Dallas campus and talking about a Guatemala City campus and talking about renovating a building so we can reach youth and, and raise up more leaders. And we're talking about holiday initiatives. All these things have lives connected to your generosity. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, John, what would you say to our church family? You know, those who right now are, are trying to connect the dots themselves between their giving and real life being impacted, how, how would you encourage our church family to jump on board and really participate in this Heaven to Earth offering? I mean, this season was, to say it was difficult was, is not enough words. Um, and in this season, we, re we reap the benefits, the fruits of everyone's generosity, of the church's generosity. And I'm not just talking about meal trains. I'm talking about the generosity that it takes to set this community up. Um, the resources that it takes to put this community together, to bring people together. Um, there was people praying with us for over 12 months, um, just walking through this season, visiting with us, just constantly encouraging us. Um, and what I would say to everyone about the Heaven and Earth offering um, is just first pray on it. Um, ask God what he wants from you. Um, the Bible says where there is unity, it commands a blessing. And in this, in this heaven to earth offering, I feel like our church family is coming together, bringing our gifts to God, and God is going to bless it. We may have two, two campuses in our vision, but he may bless us with four. Wow. And I'm believing for that. Wow. I'm believing for that. Man, that's so good. Thank you. Would you be willing to be at one of those campuses? Because we'll need some leaders there, too. Okay. Whatever you need. I know you. I know that. Hey, Victor, I'll let you uh, end here. That was beautiful, John. Um, again, just any final words of encouragement you want to give to the church family? Yes, I just want to say that we are all here because of the generosity of others. Um, let's not forget that there are people on the, there are lives on the other side, that this is not just a number, but we are called to be the church in the world. So and we are called to, op to, to reach out. Perfect. You guys, thank you for sharing your hearts. Give John and Victoria a huge round of applause. Love you guys. Um, we didn't get into all the, 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 the dark side of all that they walked through, but I'm telling you guys, to see them standing here uh, today uh, is absolutely miraculous. So I want to say also I'm really, really proud of the, all the folks that came around them, and this is why we have our connect groups, and this is why we have our prayer meetings, and this is why uh, we have serve teams. All of this together make sure we get to create a fantastic community. Uh, today... Uh, we've got something really, really exciting, though. I'm going to actually turn it over at all of our other campuses to your campus pastor uh, right now because we've got our campus pastors preaching today, even here at White Rock. So I'm really, really excited about this. Uh, first service, we had Ben Stokes step up, and then this service, we got Andrew Scott, who is in the house. Andrew, why don't you come on up here, my friend. Andrew uh, is one of 20 children. Is that right? And I'm not kidding. I'm not joking. Like, you know, people, ha, 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 ha. no, like literally 20 human beings that, you, wait, you're, you're one of 20. That's right. You have 19 siblings, 19 siblings, and uh, his parents love each other, and, and obviously have really big hearts. Uh, so we're, we're, we're going to have Andrew share today. I need you to know this guy, uh, I love him so, so much. He was our campus pastor down in Guatemala, he and his wife. And, and we brought him back up here to, to Dallas to help us serve and lead here. And he's just been doing such an amazing job. Has a great love for you, a great love for Jesus. And I'm glad he's my brother as well. Tear it up today, Andrew. I'm already proud of you. Thank you so much. All right. Good morning. Good to see you guys. I'm so excited about today. I want to welcome as well as Pastor Earl just did, um, our, everybody who's joining us online, everybody in the balcony, everybody uh, out in the lobby. We are so excited about today. And honestly, I just want you to know this. Um, we really, really love you guys. We really love you guys. You may think, hey, you don't know me. How can you love me? I'm telling you, we've been praying for you to be here and praying for your family, praying for your marriage. We love you guys. We're so glad you're here and, and we're really, really excited about today. I love this church. I love this church so much. I, I feel so incredibly honored to get to be a part of it. 
And I was, uh, I was thinking about this this, this morning that um, the, the amount of growth that has happened in my life in the last um, in the last you know six or seven years that we've been a part of this of this church, and uh, I just want to say thank you so much to pastors who who who, who um, shepherd a vision. Um, that, that, that you guys and I and my wife and my family are getting to like live out. We're getting to grow. We're getting to, to hear um, messages every single week and, and getting to grow in our leadership. And, and it's because you guys said, you know, good enough is not enough. And you said that we're gonna we're gonna live out a life that 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 um, allows people to live out everything that God has placed on the inside of them. I just want to say thank you guys, love you guys, honor you guys a ton, and and we're really grateful to be here. Love this church. This is awesome. All right, this morning I'm gonna speak to you guys just for a few minutes on this idea, uh, this Thanksgiving <laughs> weekend, on um, this idea of going back for seconds. Um, turn with me, if you will, to um, <clears throat> John chapter six. John chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1, um, and uh, I'm just going to read right through this story really quick. This is Jesus uh, and his disciples. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more context after we read the story. Okay, so it says, after this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. When Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed all these people. Feed all these people. Uh, then, then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and he said, Where, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy, the grassy slopes and the man alone numbered 5,000 people. Then Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks to God and distributed them to the people. Afterwards, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. And after everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. They picked up all the pieces and filled 12 baskets full of the scraps left by the people who had eaten the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we've been expecting. So I, I want to give a really quick um, understanding about this passage, and I'm going to kind of do this quickly because there's so much in here that I want to talk about. Um, but the reason I chose John, actually in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all tell this same story. This is one of the only uh, miracles that Jesus actually saw as so important that he referred back to it when he performed, performed other miracles. He, this was an incredibly important moment in his ministry, and honestly, I really think it's really way more about classroom for all of us than it really was about just wowing a bunch of people and doing a giant Golden Corral-style cafeteria. I think it was like a little bit more than just that. And so I want to talk about why I chose John, because um, in Matthew, you, you, you get a picture of Jesus being king, and Mark, you get a picture of kind of this factual accounting of, of the story, In Luke, you get, it's kind of like, no, no, the, he was really a man, and he really lived here, and these things really happened, but in John, um, the, John was written about 30 years after, or even maybe even a little bit longer, after the other three Gospels, and, and, and the reason, the kind of the theme, or the heart behind the book of John is really um, faith that turns into action. The idea behind John, what he's trying to say in this, is he's trying to say to us that like, hey, it's not just enough for all of us to show up here today and feel loved, and maybe for the first time in your life to realize, you know what, I am seen by Almighty God. He knows me, he sees me, he sees my issues, he sees what I'm walking through, but, but I want us to go to another level today. And our pastors have been taking us through this, this uh, series um, on mobilize. Uh, I, I, I want us to ask ourselves the question today, mobilize to what? 
Mobilized to what? Where are we going? Because a God has been breaking stuff off of us as a church. He's been healing us. He's been, he's been um, helping us to be set free from some things over the last few weeks. And now I want us to have this thing in our back of our brains and our back of our minds. It's not enough just to know that we're loved, to know we're saved, know that we've been, we've been bought with a price. But God has a purpose, a life for you and a life for me that he wants us to live. And I want us to be mobilized towards action, towards a faith that pushes us forward. And so uh, just to kind of give you a little bit more context for John, what John was trying to say in this, he says that in the very, very end of this book, he says, the disciples saw Jesus do many more miraculous signs in addition to these ones recorded in the book. But these were written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life. That's the intention of Mobilize, is that you would have life, that you would live life like you've never experienced it before, that you would experience the fullness of all God saved you from, to, 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 to save, to, to what he can save you to. So th this, is, this is really what we're, we're talking about in this. So we're going to jump right in here. The first thing that I love about this passage is that Jesus sees this crowd coming from a long way off, and he automatically already sees their need. He's already, before they even get there, he sees their need. Before you got here today, he was, he was aware of your needs. <clears throat> before you showed up and got ready and got dressed and hit snooze three times, <laughs> he was aware of the needs and the struggles you're going. I think the need specifically in this passage was hunger. And I love that because I think that, um, I think that hunger is something that uh, we can all relate to in a very real way in every area of our lives. Let, let me explain to you what I mean. Hunger is something that consumes your thoughts when you are hungry. The longer you don't eat, the more it consumes your thoughts. Um, we, I was on a road trip with my amazing, beautiful wife uh, not too long ago. Uh, I should say this is actually several years ago, um, and uh, I don't have I don't have an issue with fast food. Okay, guys, I just I don't have an issue. I, I, I mean, occasionally Whataburger really does hit the spot, you know. And so so um, we were driving, and there was no place else to get. I had to go to Whataburger. I mean, there was no there was no other places. There was no room in the inn, you know. Like there was no other place to go. And so I, so I end up at Whataburger, Hannah's like, I refuse to eat that food. And so I, I ate anyway. And so we, we continued on, and we're driving down the road, and, um, and, and it's like about two hours in, we're between this, this little area between uh, Texarkana and Little Rock, and there's nothing there, and she's getting hungrier and hungrier. She keeps mentioning it and, and bringing it up and saying it over and over again. And, and she has this thing about repetitive noises. And she hates like dripping or like squeaking and things like this. And so, so, um, so she she was. Uh, th th I had this this Whataburger cup that was sitting in the cup holder. She's like squeaking. It's like, rrr, rrr, rrr. and she's hungry. And all of a sudden, she's just like, you know, I, I can't take this anymore. Like, she, and we start this giant fight over this Whataburger cup and how fast. She, and then she goes. When we get to Little Rock, she eats, and we both like start laughing because we're like. That was the dumbest fight. Like, why did we have this fight? It was because we were hungry. And I think I, this is something that I think happens to a lot of us. A lot of us, a lot of us uh, are going through some, we have some things we don't want to consume our thoughts. You know, our marriage, anxiety, depression, job, family stuff, broken relationships. We don't want those things to consume our thoughts, but they do consume our thoughts. And I just think that, that that hunger is something that Jesus is seeing and he's wanting to deal with and he's wanting to pinpoint and he's wanting to say you don't have to live in that anymore. And, and so that leads us to our next part right here where he asked this question of Philip, how are we going to feed all these people? And, and, and I think it's funny because Philip just answers very matter-of-factly. You, you may ask, like, well, what, what, you know, was Philip, like, specifically, like, faithless? Is that why he asked F Philip? Because he's trying to test Philip's faith. Well, actually, no, Philip is just from the area. He's from that area. And, and so most likely he was kind of the most practical person to eat, to ask about where will we find something to eat. And Philip responds very factually, nope. I have no idea. Like, it's going to take months and months and hard work, and there's no way we can do this. And so, sorry, Jesus, I got no answers for you. And then, and then just, a, just the next verse, it says, Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But, but what good is that with this huge crowd? 
And, I, and immediately, Jesus doesn't even respond to that question. He just says, have everybody sit down. I'm ready to go. And I think that these two, these, two, these two points, these two verses are incredibly connected. And what I mean by that is I feel like when Jesus is asking Philip, he's testing Philip, hey, what are we going to do about these needs that we see? <clears throat> I think that he's not doing it with kind of like, you're probably going to fail this question. You're probably going to answer incorrectly. He's actually asking with a, a desire to spark faith on the inside of Philip. He really actually wants to see, hey, Philip, can you go with me on this? Can, can we go together on this? Is it possible that there's more happening here than you're aware of? And Andrew speaks up and he says, well, I mean, I got, I got these, 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 these few loaves and I've got these two fish. And so, so, like, I mean, I don't know, but it's not enough. You know, there's no way it's enough. And Jesus is saying in this passage that if you'll just bring me what you would say is not enough. I can take that not enough, and I can make it more than enough. And this is the, the beauty of, of, of what faith really is. It's not about you having this giant quantity of faith. It's not about how much faith that, that, that you have. It's not, it's, it's not this kind of like measuring stick of faith. It's really what is your faith in? Where are you looking to? Who, who is the person where you are placing your faith? And, and when Jesus sees that, he is able to be activated into movement. He's able to be activated into, into doing something. He's like, okay, that's all I need. That's all I need. I just need everybody to sit down. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm about to do something here. It's one of the things that I love about this season of heaven to earth, this heaven to earth offering is, um, is that just in case you guys don't know this, the need of Dallas, the need of Antigua is far greater than $700,000. <clears> the need, that doesn't even scratch the surface for what God has for this church. Doesn't even get close. That $700,000 that we have said, God, would you challenge our faith? We want to see you provide this and bring this in. That is our, fi our five loaves and our two fish where we're saying, Lord, can you take our not enough? And can you, and can you do campuses? And can you touch lives over, over the internet and through uh, online campuses and across the world? Can you touch lives with our not enough? And, and, and God is saying, all I, it's all I need. All, it's all I need. I, he, he, please hear me when I say this. If, you're, if it's in your brain, like this is what churches do, they just raise money, they did it, whatever, whatever baggage you have in your brain, can I just say, we don't, are not here to ask you for your money. What I'm asking you, what our pastors are asking you in this season is we're asking you to have faith. We're asking you to believe God for a little bit more than maybe you have believed God before. Maybe to take your not enough, whether it's $100,000 or $1,000 or $100 or a dollar, to take that not enough and take it to the Lord and to say, Lord, what can you do with this? What can you do with this? This this not enough because it will be more than enough in the name of Jesus. I remember when my wife uh, Hannah and I were, uh, we were, we were missionaries for, for a few years uh, in, in Guatemala before coming to Shoreline, and we didn't know anything about fundraising. We didn't know anything about, like, like what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. We just, uh, we literally had, uh, we had $35 pledged a month, <laughs> and we, um, <coughs> pardon me, and we actually, um, we, we, we went anyway, um, and uh, we, I had a truck, I sold it for like $4,000, and that was what we were going to live on for a year. And so um, we end up in Guatemala, and um, we, we felt like God was t telling us to step out and build a house. And so we end up building this house that costs us like $25,000. And uh, in the end of the year, I go back and, 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 you know, paid every bill, never missed a meal. In the very, very end of the year... I, um, I, I remember going back and doing my taxes, and I, I looked at my taxes, and we all, I could only find enough checks and money and income for like $7,500. 
And I was like, I don't know how, <laughs> how did I write all those checks? And where did all that money come from? And what was I thinking? For Don't do it that way, okay? It's a bad, it's a bad, bad plan. That's not what I'm advocating whatsoever. But what I'm advocating is at some point in the middle of that obedience, God met us and a, mir a miracle began. And he began, he began to provide for ways that we didn't even know. I don't, I genuinely to this day, don't know how all that worked out or how it happened. But God provided for us in a miraculous way. And you see that uh, back, going back to this passage where uh, in, in verse 11 he says, he says that then Jesus took those loaves and he gave thanks to God. He distributed them to the people and, and, and afterwards he did the same with the fish. And he's, they're telling the story of how Jesus began to distribute this. Luke actually tells it this way. I like, I like Luke's version better because it paints this picture of, of Jesus says he took these five loaves and these two fish and he looked towards heaven and he blessed them. He says, then breaking off pieces of the loaves, he kept giving bread and fish and to the people until they distributed. Okay, so just hang on. Just like think about this. <clears throat> we have 5,000 men. Most likely, the way that they, they counted back in those times, uh, most likely it was somewhere between eighteen to 20,000 people in this crowd with women and children. So think about just trying to even feed this room. Think how much time that would have taken. So, so 20,000 people, this is a stadium full of people on this hillside that he's feeding. And he's just breaking off piece after piece after piece, filling basket after basket with fish and with bread. And I was just thinking, as, I was, as, as these disciples are just like, okay, we're going to do this again. They grab another basket and they go back out to this great giant crowd and they distribute the food. And then they, they, they take that empty basket and they, they go back and they say, okay, okay here's another basket. We're going to go do this again. At what point in that journey did they realize that a, that, that, that a miracle was happening right in front of them? And I just think this morning, for a lot of us, there's some people here that, that, that you, you, you're, you're, you, you, know, you had that experience with Jesus where, you know, he grabs you by the hand and he said, stand up and walk. And you stood up and walk like it just like, like, it, just like it happened in, in John 5 with the crippled man. He, you stand up and walk and instantaneously your life has been transformed the moment you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. But, you, but then you've been trying, you've been on a serve team and going to growth track and you've been, you've been trying to, to, to work out some of these issues that you, you came here with. And some of the things that the hurts and the pains and the baggage and the financial stuff that you've been working through for maybe for a few years and, and you're in the middle. You're just kind of basket after basket after basket and you're in the middle of this process. You're believing, God, I know you're going to do something. I know it's going to be better than I could possibly imagine. But, but, it, but maybe you're in the middle of this situation. You're going back for seconds and going back for seconds and still believing God. And in the middle there, you got tired a little bit. In the middle there, you got tired and just wondered and, and forgot that the thing that God was, was doing in your life in this moment was miraculous. The change and the transformation that's going on inside your family and inside your life is miraculous. And I just want to encourage you this morning because I, 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 I just want to encourage you not to give up. I want to encourage you to grab that basket and keep going back. Because I think that the, 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 the secret to be unlocked in this, in this parable, is, in, in this story, I should say, in this miracle, is really very, very simple. And, and, the, and the, the, the message that Jesus is trying for us to get and not to miss is that our life, our power, our transformation, our provision, everything that we need for our lives, the life that he has promised us, is found in him. And it doesn't always happen where they, they, you, th that he comes by and grabs you by the hand and says, you need to stand up, take up your bed, walk, go home, you're healed, it's all over. But sometimes it happens that, that you and I are just asked to keep grabbing baskets and keep going back and saying, God, I'm empty again. And I need you to fill me up because I can't keep doing this without you. And I think there's some people under the sound of my voice here in this auditorium right now who, are, who've, who just kind of got tired. And you just kind of like set that basket down. And maybe they were living out and seeing that miracle. But, but, but today, right now, if you're honest with yourself, you'd say, you know what, I, I, I'm just kind of waiting to see what happens. I, I, I've been coming to, to church for two years and, and I really thought some of these things would be different by now. I really thought some of these things would have changed by now. 
And, and I just want to challenge you that, that, that today that, that it's not too late to grab that basket. It's not too late to go back and one more time and say, Lord, I'm empty and I need you to fill me up. Lord, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I can't even tell you how many times my wife and I in the last year and a half have been at this place where we were, we had an empty basket and we didn't know where to go with that empty basket. And we're just like on our knees before God and we're just saying, God, we, it's not in us to keep trying. It's not in us. There's the, there's the, I, I don't have the strength on the inside of me right now to keep on going back for more and going back for more, but, but we did. We kept going back for more. And every, si every single time we showed up, every single time we were there uh, at that place in front of Jesus, we're like, Lord, would you fill it up again? Lord, would you come in and would you, would you breathe into me what's not on the inside of me right now? Every single time he did it. Every single time he blew life back into my body and life back into my spirit. And I just want to challenge some of you guys this morning. That maybe some of us need to have that happen in our hearts today again, all over again today. You're, you're showing up empty. And you've done this a hundred times. But today, today, may, maybe God is, has done that work in your heart and he's sparked a little bit of faith. What can you do with these five loaves? What can you do with these three fish? What can you do with this, Lord? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me just for one second? We're just going to pray for just a second. I want to do this really quickly. I'm just going to invite anybody here who feels like that they stopped, whether, whether here or watching online or in the balcony, wherever you are right now, if you feel like you've stopped going back to Jesus as your source. If you're empty this morning and and you have it, all you have to show for it is an empty basket, an empty life, an empty heart. And you just, you just, you're just yearning for that power. You're yearning for that grace. You're yearning for that, that infilling of that power and that faith that comes only from Him. And I just want to ask, if that's you this morning, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you <clears throat> to throw your hand up in the air as a way of saying, Lord, I need you to fill me up. Lord, I need you. I'm only turning to you. I'm not turning to anything else. I'm not turning to any other person, any other book, any other, any other source. I'm turning to you. You're the one I'm going to. You're the one I'm looking for. You're the one I, uh, you're the only one that I need. If that's you this morning on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to shoot your hand up in the air as a way of saying, yes, Lord, I'm going back. I'm going back. So on the count of three, we're going to do this together. One, two, three. Shoot your hand up in the air as a way of saying, yes, me. I'm going back. I'm not, I'm not going to stop. I'm not, if it's a hundred more times, I'm going back. And I'm going to go back. And I'm going to go back. And I'm going to go back. If there's anybody else here, I want to invite you to shoot your hand up in the air as a way of just saying, yes, that's me. That's me. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to stop going back. He's my source. He's, the, he's my reason. If you're here today, you can put your hands down. Thank you, guys. If you're here today and today you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ, never made him Lord, never made him number one, but today uh, you're, you're under the sound of my voice and you would like to make that happen. You would like to surrender your heart to Jesus. I'm asking if you pray, I'm asking if you have a Bible, I'm asking you, is your life surrendered to Jesus? Is he in the driver's seat? If not, on the count of three, I want to invite you as well to throw, shoot your hand in the air as a way of saying, Lord, you can have it all. One, two, three. Three, just shoot your hand up in the air as a way of saying, that's it. That's me. That's me. Pray for me. I want to be prayed for. I want to, I want to be in on that prayer. I see, I see those hands. Thank you. Okay, let's do this real quick. Let's, let's place our hands over our hearts right now. And, uh, and we're going to pray together. If you'll pray after me. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I admit that I've made mistakes. But today, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Give me the power to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's lift our heads. Let's celebrate for all of those who made that decision.